uh, fortunate to have people willing to, to take this on. Uh, as we transition here, I, if you've seen the schedule, you know that we have three lightning round, three presenters during this lightning round session. Each one of those people have about seven minutes. Um, I'm going to do a brief um, sort of introduction, uh, telling you about the, the, the person and, and their topic title. And I'm going to turn it over. We have them listed in the schedule. I'm just going to follow that if it's okay with the participants. Is that okay with you guys? I can, I can see you. Okay, great. Um, so we have three, three presenters. Brianna Anderson is uh, from the University of Florida. Her presentation, which I think is really drawn from a, a larger work, is what will the world be like when I grow up? Picturing children's eco-activism in World War III illustrated number 46. And then we have a second presentation from Samantha Cotrera, who is a education historian, uh, writer, educator from York University. I hope I got that right. Um, and her presentation, not all, not all graphic histories are created equal. And then finally, and I'm going to apologize for, for if I don't get your name completely right, Jason Laptis. Is that right? You can tell me. No, it's close enough. All right, that's that's the close enough thumbs up. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You're a kind man. Um, and he is doing a presentation, Creators Communities in the Time of Quarantine. Oh, that's on, that's on point. Thank you very much, sir. Um, <laughs> so we're supposed to start at 11.15. Everyone's got seven minutes. So I'm going to turn over to Brianna. Again, thank you for your willingness to shift to this potent short presentation style. I think it's going to be great for us. So take it away. And you do have the opportunity to share your screen if you wish. OK, let me pull up my PowerPoint. OK. So as the devastating snowstorms in Texas last week vividly demonstrated, we are in the middle of an escalating global climate emergency that disproportionately affects poor and marginalized communities. In response to this crisis, children and teenagers like Greta Thunberg and co-founder of the Youth Climate Strike, Isra Hersey, have increasingly assumed roles as vocal environmental activists, attracting widespread media attention and controversy for their demonstrations and speeches. In this presentation, though, I want to draw attention to another form of youth, youth activism that the media and scholars have largely overlooked. And these are zines produced by young people in response to climate change. Founded in 1979, the World War III Illustrated Anthology series publishes political zines produced by a diverse collective of activist creators. Published in 2015, issue number 46, Youth and Climate Change, prominently features zines created by young people alongside the work of seasoned adult creators. These multi-generational contributions explore two overlapping themes. One, our planet's growing climate crisis, and two, how young people are confronting the climates they have inherited, social, political, cultural, and especially environmental. For this short talk, I will briefly analyze just two of the issues you've created texts that demonstrate how zines can empower children and teenagers to advocate against climate change and other large-scale social problems. First, high schooler Alejandro Coolant's two-page zine, The Wasteland, remixes familiar mass culture artifacts to confront readers with the horrors of environmental devastation. The zine consists of a single illustration jam-packed with dystopian imagery. In the middle, we have a leafless tree studded with light bulbs and electric sockets. Uh, up on the left-hand corner, we have a train car marked with a radioactive symbol that travels along a splintered track covered in litter. And up to the right-hand side, we have industrial smokestacks that pump dark smog into the sky. Alongside this bleak landscape, a one-sentence poem appears in the bottom left corner, saying, the world is either dying before it can achieve its dream, or it has lived long enough to see that it was never attainable in the first place. As the paratextual note included below the author's name indicates, the poem alludes, alludes to a well-known line of dialogue spoken by Harvey Dent in the Dark Knight Batman film, where he says, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Neither the illustration nor the poem provides any hint as to what exactly the earth may have dreamed of. However, the prominent placement of human-made machines and materials in the illustration strongly suggests that humanity has caused the world's death, or at the very least, its disillusionment with its dream, whatever that is. 
by reformulating the Batman quote in a visual narrative that tacitly casts blame on humans for environmental ruin, Kulin employs a zine-making strategy that Janice Radway terms insubordinate creativity, the use of ready-to-hand cultural materials to explode, fragment, and recreate traditional forms of mass culture. In other words, Kulin appropriates and remixes icons of mass culture, the Batman quote, light bulbs, packages of junk food on the train tracks, and so on, to confront readers with the villainy of everyday human actions and industrialization, rather than the supervillains figured in American pop culture. Moreover, the absence of a traditional heroic counterpoint to the villainy represented in the scene also implicitly invites readers to consider how they can fill this role and help to stem or prevent the rampant environmental destruction represented in the horrifying illustration. Though on the surface, this reinvention of the Batman narrative may seem derivative or even perhaps a bit silly, I argue that The Wasteland demonstrates how young activists can use handmade zines to critique consumer society and resist dominant ideologies by transforming these familiar cultural symbols into alternative narratives that convey environmentalist messages. While most of the zines published in this issue focus on climate change from a strictly environmental perspective, my second example, Ops on the Block, portrays a different kind of change in climate, an urban landscape undergoing gentrification. This five-page zine was created by teenage members of Educated Little Monsters, a local grassroots art organization that serves Brooklyn youth of color. The narrative centers on a fictional group of teens as they discuss the heightened police presence in the neighborhood, their personal experiences with racial profiling, and the new people, presumably upper class, primarily white gentrifiers, who have recently moved in. The creators use collage to illustrate this conversation, blending hand-drawn illustrations, texts, and black and white photographs they took in their own gentrifying neighborhoods. Police cars figure prominently in many of the photos, emphasizing the oppressive presence of law enforcement in the teenager's environment, both in the world of the zine and in the real world of the creators. By literally pasting their own stories over the photographic evidence of gentrification and police surveillance, the creators juxtapose symbols of the invading dominant culture with a collective youth-centered perspective typically relegated to the margins. Their physical insertion of alternative viewpoints disrupts the authority exerted by these symbols and asks readers to consider how these spaces seek to erase the narratives and groups represented in the zine. Significantly, these collage panels only include textual narration from the teenage characters, not from the featureless police officers driving the cars, or the unseen hipsters who have transformed the kid's favorite corner shop into an upscale cafe. As a result, the zine's visual narrative enables the creators to challenge stereotypical power dynamics between law enforcement, gentrifiers, and urban teenagers by granting primacy to the youth voices superimposed over the photographs. I will conclude by noting that like most zines, both The Wasteland and Ops on the Block are conspicuously amateurish and non-commercial. And I don't mean this in a derogatory way, of course. By using non-professional artwork produced with everyday materials to advocate against their changing climates, these texts suggest that everyone can create meaningful art about the issues that matter to them, regardless of age, artistic ability, or physical resources. As Stephen Duncombe notes, zines are a model of participatory cultural production and organization to be acted upon. The message that you get from zines is that you should not just be getting messages, you should be producing them as well. Of course, the activism taking place in the pages of this anthology does not resemble the large-scale youth-centered environmental advocacy figured in the media, and the anthology's impact has been limited by its small print run and relative obscurity. As Allison Pipemeyer writes, if we want a form of expression and activism that will cause large-scale social change, something equivalent to the social justice movements of the 1960s and 1970s, then we'll be disappointed in zines. As small-scale acts of resistance, though, these scenes demonstrate how the medium can empower young people to engage in activism, both by providing youth-centered perspectives on environmental and social issues, and by implicitly inviting readers of all ages to participate in their own activist scene creation. So I will end there, but thank you. Brianna, thank you. That was right on time. I really appreciate it. Um, next up in our schedule is Dr. Samantha Contrera. Contrera, sorry. There you go. Samantha. Uh-oh. Uh, 
one second here. Samantha. Oh, I suspected that is a internet problem. Uh, Jason, yeah, we can. I'm sure she will be back. She she is a digital native, if ever there was one. But Jason, if you want to hop in her slot, we will circle back. Oh, oh, she's back. Samantha, Samantha, are you good to go? Yeah, my connection keeps dropping. Hopefully, um, hopefully I'll be okay. <laughs> All right, take it over. Go, okay, go, great. Go. So hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Samantha Cotrera, and I am a history education strategist based in Toronto, Canada. What that means is that I help individuals and organizations teach history in ways that I say are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. And a big part of that work is really emphasizing the affective, emotional, creative, story-based connections that we all have with history, but, um, but that youth are really trying to figure out. And because you are familiar with this field, you won't be surprised that I talk about graphic histories quite a lot. But when I work with individuals and organizations on introducing the importance of graphic novels and narratives to the ways that they can teach and learn history, is I really like to emphasize that not all comics and graphic novels and graphic narratives are created equal. And that just because it's a new medium for a uh, uh, for the people I'm talking to, not that it is a new medium. Um, just because it's a new medium doesn't mean that everything that is created in a comic book is, is, is pushing the boundaries of how we can teach and learn history. So I'm going to show you a couple slides that I use when I'm talking to teachers to show kind of those distinctions in a way that may be helpful if you are working with teachers and librarians um, about how to frame this connection and, and a conversation. Because a lot of the work that, like the work that Brianna just talked about and the work that was talked about in the last session helps push these narratives, but often people will gravitate towards the books that they're the, the books that show narratives that they're familiar with, which then kind of reproduces um, and in some ways kind of embeds a traditional form of narrative. So let me just flip over to my PowerPoint. So I say how I talk about how um, graphic narratives can tell newer, deeper, more emotional, more emotional, more narrative stories. Um, I talk about The War of the Trenches, which is such a fantastic book. Um, we can see things like psychological isolation and brutal conditions through graphic novels. Um, there's a lot of really great graphic works on residential schools um, for Indigenous people from the government of uh, Canada, as well as different churches. And so I talk about these examples as well. We can see things like pain, but we can also see things like resistance. And then there's also graphic novels like this, where we can really see things like landscape and material culture. But when we look at these same pages, we can also think about what is missing and what is drawn out of history. And these are the elements that I really encourage people to be able to, to think about more so. So I'll be honest, this, if you know this book, you know that this isn't a great example because of how varied this particular book is. But if you're only going to use a segment of this book, are we suggesting that it is only old men that are, uh, that are fighting this war? When we look at this book, and I've actually written a blog post about graphics related to residential schools, are we only focusing on the church and we're, we are not focusing on things like government culpability? And like, this is, this is the worst one. Um, are, we, are Indigenous people only helpmates? Like you can see that there is a woman in the background who is representing Indigenous people, but are they only helpmates? Um, these are the types of things that we want to push our students to be able to think about when we are teaching with graphic narratives, because a text like this, while it may seem that it is, you know, all graphic narratives or graphic narratives, this does something different than um, a text like this or a text like this, even when there may be omissions in the narrative. One of the books that I talk about a lot is this Louis Royale, a comic strip um, 
I always write bibliography. It's biography, not bibliography. And I also just noticed this, the Italian cover. So anyway, <laughs> I don't I really like this book. So maybe that's why um, I talk about this book a lot because this book is often talked about in Canadian circles as like this groundbreaking work. And it is used in a lot of different classrooms. Um, this book I find is terrible. <laughs> this book is so incredibly sexist. And I was introduced to this book as a way to decolonize history. But what I saw was the exclusion of women in such a way that it was really perpetrating ideas of colonialism and patriarchy and capitalism in ways that we may have been able to overlook or ignore or read into differently if we weren't looking at the images. So in the research that I've done, and this is the citation, um, but of course, um, Julian or can, you know, it's available out there. Um, when I looked at this image, and I looked at this book, there are 1,420 um, hand-drawn frames, and only 3% of them include women. 3%. Um, and, and half of these are in large group scenes. So that is 20 frames in this whole book features a woman who speaks or has a name because there's women that have names that don't speak and there are women who speak but have no names um, and when you're looking at the history of this time period um, it uh, Lawrence Barkwell a historian in this field says one cannot have a complete appreciation of the 1885 Northwest resistance without considering the women of the resistance and the matriarchal nature of the Métis so sometimes people can say things like oh well just like you know Women weren't really there in the past, but that's not true. When I looked at this book and those, those 20 frames or those 40 frames, I found that women were shown in these three ways, either as passive helpmates, holding back action, or absent, which is very, very similar to how traditional histories have patriarchally um, excluded women. And when I look at the source material from Maggie Siggins' book, Riel, A Life of Revolution, um, while the image for the graphic novel is very sparse, she actually writes about a gaggle of people that were traveling with this man. I also have a YouTube video about this and it was really great this week because someone wrote uh, in a comment that was like, oh, I'm reading this for a class and I just thought people were misogynistic. Well, they were, but the, this book in particular is misogynistic. In the last 15 seconds that I have, because I know Julian is very strict on time, um, I want to just bring up these two examples as well. Um, the Silence of Our Friends and March were both illustrated by Nate Powell, but obviously have different writers. Whereas March is this fantastic book that includes women, and you can see this on, well actually I don't know which side you're looking at, the one, the side that's darker, that women are really prominent in in the action, the silence of our friends actually has women very much in the background. And so even though it's the same time period, same illustrations, you can see these ways that women are drawn out of history and that we have to be able to uh, be able to encourage people to tell new stories through these narratives rather than be okay with just using some sort of new narrative but think it's doing something in a different way. So that's my presentation. Julian, I know, that, look, I'm, I got the time. Don't worry, I'm good. This is my contact information. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them when we are done. Yeah, this makes me seem like a time, uh, time Nazi, but uh, I really Would you say I was over time? No, I said it makes me seem like a time time dictator, but- It's okay, uh, I, really I, have, I have the time here on my, my corner too. I knew you were I coming. Really I really appreciate your uh, presentation. And uh, Jason, uh, the floor is yours. For those of you wondering, we will handle questions um, once Jason is completed and we'll, we'll be able to ask all the presenters uh, about their presentation. So Jason, take it away. Thank you, Julian. Great job, by the way, everyone before me, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. It's nice to be part of such an event. So good morning, and I'm here to tell you a, a story and I'm gonna need a little bit of artistic license. So I hope you'll, you'll give me that. It includes two evil empires and seven brave heroes, amazing sci-fi technology, a deadly plague, a YouTube channel that sounds like it could be a cult. It might be a cult. I think I'm in a cult. 
and some artistic introverts with a lethal blend of means, motive, and opportunity. My name is Jason Lapidus. I'm the visual artist half of Group of Seven Comics, an action adventure comic book series set during World War I, featuring seven famous Canadian historical figures on a fictional mission to save the world. And along with my excellent collaborator, writer Chris Sanigan, we are finishing up our next story called Peregrines about an elite unit of spies undercover as nurses on the front lines of the First World War. Also, we've been sharing a webcomic through Instagram for the month of February as a creative experiment, creating three images a day to tell an original 84 panel story featuring the Peregrines in action. And I'm coming to you today from my studio just north of Toronto. It's no surprise with this kind of audience, right, this comic book audience that we have here, um, that the quite often uh, solitary and quiet act of reading a comic has been connected to, for better or for worse, large scale sensory overload public events like Comic Cons. So what happens when that connection is broken and the communities formed around conventions and local comic book stores are no longer able to serve their membership from a social point of view? Of course, uh, many relationships disappear, hopefully only temporarily, and some are able to adapt within the virtual landscape. So here's some background on what I'd like to talk about today. In the early 90s, when faced with what they believed were unfair working conditions and unfair working relationships, seven Marvel artists quit to form their own comic publishing organization and enterprise eventually. And we're talking about the late 80s superstars like Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, etc. And they brought their top selling style to create original characters that are very much from that over the top and to the extreme era. And they influenced a generation of readers, putting their stamp on a time known for both a spectacular boom and the inevitable bust. Now, move forward to 2019 and the hosts of Cartoonist Kayfabe a YouTube channel that's focused on pulling back the curtain of the world of cartooning. They issued a wild challenge to their ever-growing viewership. The challenge was to create an underground comic or zine that connects the characters that were created by the founding members of Image Comics through a large-scale overarching narrative called Image Grand Design. Ed Piscor, known for many projects, including Hip Hop Family Tree, and Jim Rugg, known for Street Angel, Plain Janes, and many others, are two cartoonists out of Pittsburgh. And they fostered a vibrant fan base through their comics and through their YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. When the pandemic hit and we entered the quarantine, uh, a Facebook group based around that YouTube channel called Cartoonist Kayfabe Ringside Seats began tossing around the idea of actually making the proposed unauthorized fan comic. Before long, Zoom brainstorming meetings turned into late night Zoom drawing sessions. Collaborations, friendships, and creative conflicts all contributed to this growing sense of community. And a year later, and the epic comic is done. Image Grand Design is already off to print. 146 pages, over 30 creators across five countries. I would argue that this kind of project that the, is one that the image comics creators themselves could not have completed due to things like creative differences, schedules, egos, and despite their immeasurable talent and their resources. And as amazing as this accomplishment is, uh, the community has developed through the blend of the YouTube channel and the Facebook group and then the Zoom meetings, these three things kind of converge and it's uh, transforming into really something unique individuals that have previously perceived themselves as fans and maybe wannabe creators have inspired and pushed each other to become published cartoonists. Almost like a virtual collective in a way, seizing the lockdown as the opportunity to finally put up or shut up using that steel sharpened steel mentality. It's really, it's been, it's been amazing to watch. In the short time together, members have shared their art, which we all know can be a very intimate and intimidating experience bringing everyone closer together. And yes, idiosyncrasies have naturally alienated some members, uh, but the group members have also shared their personal tragedies and losses, the breaking up of families, as well as the celebrating of things like new jobs and even the birth of a baby. 
From a local perspective, I've noticed that a disproportionate number of ringside seats members are from Southern Ontario, uh, many of whom I have had the pleasure of meeting before 2020. And maybe that shouldn't come as a surprise given uh, that Toronto is such a vibrant comics city. Participating in Image Grand Design, or participating in the Image Grand Design fan comic project has strengthened many of those bonds that were previously established and provided the essential feeling of finding your people. So many adults, or so many adults, I should say, have forgotten that the gateway to being, becoming a cartoonist can be as simple as pencil and paper. You know, we carry around this falsehood that one needs to be highly skilled to be invited into the inner circle of comics creators and that only a select few are given a voice. And Ed and Jim's YouTube channel has demystified a lot of the comic creation process. And the Facebook group has provided the emotional encouragement to create and share our comics. Add the emotional surge of making better comics because of a tip uh, from a community member or a tool passed down from one friend to another. It's no surprise that new collectives are being formed, cross-border distribution channels are being made, and friends are supporting friends to make more comics. Now, regardless of how you feel about Marvel and DC as the big two back in the 1980s, Image Comics was a reaction to the traditional power structure of the day. And regardless of your feelings about 90s comic style, uh, the independent spirit demonstrated by the seven emerging, sorry, the seven image founders, it still inspires creative people during this very difficult isolation to use their eagerness to learn, uh, create, and share the medium that we all love. Uh, you can learn more about the unauthorized fan comic by keeping an eye on www.imagegranddesign.com. And you can follow our cool original web comic on Instagram at Group of Seven Comics. And find me at Jason Lapidus on social media, preferably Instagram. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Julian. Thank you so much. And thank you all the presenters for uh, delivering on that time limit that's associated with the lightning round. It's not because I am the dictator. It's because lightning rounds are short. Uh, <laughs> so we do have a question um, from the chat. And not surprisingly, and that question is for Samantha. Um, how much does the focus on individual characters, particularly historically noble men, drive these problems of representation? Which I think you kind of talked about, but maybe want to say a little bit more about. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't quite know. Um, uh, I don't quite know like where the question is coming from. So I'm going to answer in a way that I'm thinking, but it may be a little different than how the question actually was posed. Yes, there are a lot of big men <laughs> that we think of in history. But um, one thing that graphic novels can do really well and any sort of graphic medium when we are talking about history. And so I think about movies as well. And that was really cool to listen about film studies in the session before is that the creators can also demonstrate the world, <laughs> how the world around these historical characters are made up of both men and women. And that's what I really thought was great about March and also um, Ava DuVernay's uh, uh, movie Selma, which and they came out at the same time, because women were so integral to the stories. And I want to say background characters, but I don't mean it in a pejorative way. I mean, as like people that were there. And so while we're focusing on one great man, um, the context of the people that surround these stories um, are very much present. And that's why I use Silence of Our Friends and March as this example that you can talk about you know one main character who is a male but have these background scenes that really demonstrate the complexities and diversities of of people <laughs> like just people and um and that is about gender and about gender expression it's also about race and about class and things like that as well so i hope that answers where you were were going with that question that's a, great, that's a great answer, and maybe we'll get a chance to follow up on, on that response. But we do have a question for Brianna. Uh, that question is, how did you stumble upon the zines you talked about, and have you explored a critical making your own zines as a scholarship and or pedagogical practice? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so for the first part, this project is part of my larger dissertation, which is looking at 
representations of climate change and environmental disaster in comics created for children. So I knew going into the project that I wanted to not just look at ones created for children, but also comics by children that center their voices. And there are not a lot of um, published examples out there. That's just the nature of zines, right? They're um, ephemeral, they're produced in small quantities, they're hard to track down. Um, so Dr. Margaret Galvin, who I see is in attendance here, actually um, introduced me to this volume. And um, there are a few other case studies I'm looking at in my dissertation. And then for the second part of the question, yes, um, I am currently teaching an upper division class on environmental children's literature. And my students' first project that they are actually turning in tonight is to create their own environmental picture book or comic or zine of some sort so that they're not just reading different image texts in my class, but they are then taking those concepts and the issues that we've been discussing and applying it to their own uh, critical making. So I'm very excited to see what they turn in today. So thank you. Uh, Jason, here's a question for you. As a creator, a practitioner, do you see the, the possibilities and what are the possibilities and limitations around the communities of practice and projects that you're talking about. Is this a way to expand comic practice in a very particular way? What are, what are the opportunities? Are there any limitations related to no a project like this? Right? No limits. I mean, considering that for, for the longest time, the means of distribution and the means of production have been in very limited hands. And the means of creation have been in limited hands, right? Access, literacy, things like that are really important changes that have happened, you know, around these parts in the last hundred years, but with the invention of the internet and with digital comics and uh, the reminder, I mean, that this art form is one that can be so rudimentary and so basic, really. It, the smiley face goes a long way and we can all draw a stick figure and a smiley face. And, and once we put that to paper, uh, you can make your own comics and probably even do something more basic than that. So I don't think there's any limits to it, truthfully. Um, the barrier, I think, will just be about finding other individuals that have the drive to get it done. And I find that to be, in my very limited experience in comics, to be like the biggest separator between individuals is simply the drive to finish something that you start and get it out there. Skill is not part of the conversation. Talent is not part of the conversation. It's just the willingness to complete something and the willingness to share it. And uh, that will be the barrier, I think, that most people need to deal with, given that the smartphone is such a, a common thing. Put it on Instagram, you're done. Published. Whatever that word means today, I don't know. I hope uh, that answers um, your question. Oh, it does. It does. I, we have another question for, for Samantha. Um, do you think the recent Metis created comic about this history echo series by Catherine Brumetti can dislodge Brown's book from the centrality to Canadian comics canon? That's a very entire Canada question, but probably I think a very important one because this, this question of canon is always uh, uh, central. I think your, your work really calls our attention to that. Well, it is a Canadian centric question in that like, I know, I know what they're talking about. <laughs> Um, but it isn't a Canadian centric question in that, like, do you think that this book, Chester Brown's book that's gotten so much, um, so much press related to Métis history and uh, Métis is a group of people uh, that uh, is a particular like ethnocultural group that came from, oh, this is an awkward answer that came from uh, uh, like uh, intermarriage between indigenous people and European people. It's a separate ethnocultural group. Chester Brown is not Métis. So while Louis Royale is known as this Métis hero, this Canadian hero, um, Chester Brown is not Métis. Whereas there are a lot of amazing graphic artists right now who are Métis, who are indigenous, that are writing back their stories. And so while this notion of Métis may not be as relevant for an American audience. The notion of can we have this other this other group of story makers dislodge this kind of white guy's version is is something I'm sure that Americans can appreciate as well. And the answer is 
Probably not. And the reason why is because of while while Chester Brown's book does push the boundaries and that it brings up a Métis here, uh, uh, Métis history, it doesn't do so in a way that really dislodges too much of how we're trying to understand ourselves as white Canadians, for example. Whereas the book by by books by Indigenous and Métis artists and and Inuit artists do, and so just like any sort of text, the ones that are safer are the ones that the majority white people. Um, men, people with middle class, upper class tendencies are going to go towards. Um, Sean Carlton's work, and he's going to be doing a lightning round later on, talks a lot about the activism in comics and how you can bring in these histories of labor, for example, to these stories. But the safer ones are the ones that people are going to gravitate towards. So while there are a lot more books that are coming out now by Indigenous and Métis writers and creators, and I certainly hope that they are going to they're going to be more prominent in school libraries. I don't think they'll be more prominent in a grade eight Canadian history classroom, for example, the way Chester Brown's book will be. And that's because it is a safe narrative that's within a timeline that white settler Canadians are familiar with. So I feel like I bumbled through some of that, but I think, I think <laughs> the end of it was clear. <laughs> No, no, and I want to uh, say to my Canadian friends, I am not uh, against Canadian questions. Uh, I was <laughs> really sort of alluding to the fact that the the nature of that historical question I actually think resonates with American canonical cultural narratives, which yeah. I stumbled through. So, like, no, I, I didn't I, think I, you I were Canada. against it. Yeah, yeah, I, I love Canada. <laughs> I Canada's a great place, it. right? You know. Um, Canadians are our friends. Um, do we have any? Um, I don't see any current question. Oh, wait, nope. Um, I do have another question. This one's really complicated. It's from um, uh, okay, so it's a question about historiography. I want to thank Bill Hart Davidson um, from MSU for this question. And he's asking a kind of Hayden White-esque question he describes it as um, in regards to his, 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 about historiography, but using visual language. So I think the question here has to do with like, what are the implications of using the sort of visual record in terms of trying to challenge the sort of way that we think about how history is created? And I think both in, in all your cases, there's a there's an implication here on how we think about the, the record, the canonical record and the way that visual culture could be mined at some level to create a more fuller history when we think about uh, going back to comics, but also in terms of the popular imagination, creating visual narratives that perhaps take into account the history that we know is written out of the official record in terms of like things like race and gender. So, you know, if you want to sort of comment on the potentialities around the different kinds of work that all of you are doing in regard to this question of history, uh, I think that was what Bill Hart Davidson was getting at. And if I butchered your question, Bill, you can send me an angry email and and make it clear how I butchered your question. But I think that's what he's getting at, and I, and I think that's an important question. Yeah. See. Well. I'll, I'll start and then I, I know that I'd probably link to Jason's work. So um, every historical narrative is inaccurate, every single one. And it's often the ones that challenge how we understand the world that we will say are the most inaccurate. And, uh, and so any sort of graphic narrative can be part of that. And I think that graphics are an incredibly under theorized element of how we understand history. Um, people will talk about how kids in history classes don't know any history, but they certainly know that like white men are in charge of this country by looking at the money that they have, you know, like there are so many visual elements to our history that um, surround us that I think that we need to spend more time interrogating it. And that's why I think it's so integral for us to 
think about that related to graphic narratives. And I think that this notion of imagination is really important because the more we rely on a traditional historical record, the more we're relying on words of primarily white educated moneyed men in the past. And the more we bring in imagination, the more we can bring in experiences and, um, uh, and lives that are different than the ones that are in the official record. But that doesn't mean that we can get away from historical research. And that's why I think the group of seven comic series that Jason and Chris Sanigan um, have created and written are so powerful in, in a Canadian context. I'm sure there's amazing American context. Well, Julian's work on Afrofuturism is a helpful example of that. Because you still need to do historical research to demonstrate how you are going to tell bigger stories and how you're going to use your imagination. And, and um, you know, Chester Brown's work, for example, is a historical creation. And when you look at the secondary source that he got the material from, like it is such a derivative from that. And Maggie Siggins' work is a derivative of the primary sources as well. So we can put a lot of weight and criticism towards this notion of imagination and creativity and history teaching and learning. But the fact is it's all creativity and imagination, just some with a little bit of weight behind it that we have determined as a culture that is objective and rational and logical because of a method that it uses. But that method was created by humans. So um, if we're going to talk about Hayden White, we can talk about Derrida as well. Um, that method was created by humans. And the closer we try to get to the center of the real history, the more the stories break apart and we can watch their deconstruction. We have a, I have actually have a question for Brianna. Um, the question is, um, you suggested that the comics made by children encourage children to make comics. How does the printed, the printed published form of this particular zine, um, yeah, if, if it isn't self-published, but part of an ongoing series by a publisher affect that possibility? So I guess the question is, you know, how does this zine affect the world of possible? being publication at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that um, thinking about the reception and the audience in the case of this particular zine anthology is really um, interesting and important because who's picking up the World War Three Illustrated anthology? It's probably not other kids, right? It's people who are already politically inclined, people who are activists who have probably been reading this zine for a long time or are interested in climate change, right? So. Um, I think that the odds that the, this zine is read by another child and inspires that child to make zines of their own are perhaps low just because that's not the intended audience of the anthology, right? But what is very interesting about this version of the anthology is that for each of the different zines that are created by children that are included in the anthology, there is an introduction or explanatory paratext included that is written by an adult. So for instance, for The Wasteland, there is an introductory note written by the high school teacher who taught the student. So of course, this brings up all sorts of troubling questions about agency, right? Like, did these kids create this because their teacher asked them to? Did they create it because um, they just wanted to be published, et cetera, et cetera? But I do think that because there are these paratextual notes written by teachers, written by parents, written by people who led a workshop that kids came and made climate change comics about, that people who are put, adults who are reading this, who are probably educators and activists, they um, can build on this work and create their own workshops and things like that for children. So it's perhaps an indirect kind of route for more children creating zines. But I do think that um, these paratexts are trying to invite other adults to have kids make zines, if that makes sense in a way. But of course, again, like all of the children created zines have this introductory paratext. And then none of the adult created zines in the anthology have paratexts that need to introduce them. So there's kind of a weird hierarchy created with the paratexts, but I hope that gets at the question. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. We have a, another question. And I, and I think this question uh, speaks to some broader sort of like tensions around uh, canon and historiography. And, and the question is sort of asking, how do you expand on the narrative without quote unquote, um, 
making a white man the enemy, right? Uh, and I think this is an important question because of course, increasingly as we think about uh, tensions around creating a more inclusive, more expansive history, this idea that we're marginalizing um, some of the established actors in, in, in the story becomes more and more prevalent, especially as the pol polarization of the, of the public sphere around culture becomes very prominent. What, what, do, what do we say to um, people um, when, when they are asking this question about um, the, the supposed loss or the space here? I don't want to mischaracterize the, the, the question being asked, but at the same time, I think that it sort of sheds light on a broader set of tensions around authority and access and, and power around telling narratives. So uh, how, we, how do we answer that, that sort of basic question in terms of like access and um, marginalization? Sure, sure. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about it, it's fine. Um, it's complicated stuff. Right, this is complicated, touchy, sensitive stuff. And considering that you know, Chris and I published a graphic novel about six white men in World War One, and I'm I'm like dreading the idea of counting panels as to you know how many women show up and how many panels have women in them in, in our graphic novel. I'm reminding myself that it is not the burden of every single comic to tell the story of every single experience. Right. And, and I know Samantha knows that and she wasn't at all. I'm not trying to suggest that you were getting at it that way, but it's about which is the dominant form being shared with people. And I think, you know, every creator has um, the, the opportunity to share their voice and to share a story that they want to tell in whatever way they want to tell it. But for me, the issue comes in with the issue comes in. Um, how are those things being shared with other people and who are the gatekeepers preventing stories of marginalized voices from getting to readers that that to me is for, personally that's my bigger issue is i want to if i want to read something from a marginal uh, creator who feels that they have a marginalized voice how am i going to find that that in a comic book store when getting access to diamond distribution is incredibly exclusive you know or bookstores only carry things from very specific publishers so I'm, I'm interested in challenging or discussing and exploring um, who gets access to the bookshelf and who gets access to, you know, um, CBC, like uh, CBC Reads, you know, these programs that share books from creators from in Canada or anything, of course, in the States. Uh, I don't think we should stop creators from creating whatever story they would, as long as, of course, it's not hate speech, but people should share their voice, share their stories, regardless of their ethnicity, their background of any kind. Um, but we should be thinking about what's being represented when we share people's work in, in shops and online forums and whatnot. If that, I hope that makes some sense. I think that it does. And uh, again, I, I recognize that this particular question uh, coming from a chat is going to a really hot button issue. And I recognize, um, especially from a number of different kinds of discussion we've had over the years in different forums that this is a challenge for both the audience that sees the nature of the changing narrative, um, perhaps obscuring what they see as a sort of normative narrative. But of course, as Samantha's work points out, Brianna's, yours, all of us, we can see ways that that narrative doesn't necessarily serve every member of the community. And our goals here in terms of uh, as, as creators and, and scholars is actually to create a more inclusive, which doesn't necessarily by default mean exclusive, right? Like those other actors are still there when you revisit that narrative and you make it clear that women were involved or people of color were involved and they had agency and they were a part of the story. Uh, that doesn't preclude uh, the values that you might think of as positive related to these actors but it does perhaps create a different context to understand the totality of the outcomes associated with their actions. And that's meaningful as we all strive towards a more inclusive, more cohesive future state, right? Um, I'm gonna call the audible here because I recognize that uh, it is lunchtime, at least in some time zone. And um, you guys delivered on your, your, <laughs> your, your time limits. And part of my, probably, probably part of my planning here was the allow us to 
to segue away easily. Um, I think we've answered all those the big questions. I appreciate you, as I say, taking on the challenge of speaking short because often speaking short is actually a lot more difficult than taking your sweet time and delivering on, on time. And I truly appreciate that. The lightning round number one was a huge success and I appreciate your contribution. Thanks so much. Um, we Thank are you. Gonna, <laughs> we are going to move into our lunch break. Uh, again, we understand that uh, this is we all live in a Zoom world, and we're taking the chance to uh, take some of the pressure off related to presentations. And so we have a relatively long lunch break uh, for ourselves uh, th this year's MSU Com uh, Comics Forum. So we're not going to be back really until two but we will keep the Zoom going and, and, and you'll be able to look, but look, come back around two and you will have opportunity to, to hear more about um, behind the scenes of graphic novel publishing, which is a great opportunity for us to learn more about the, the sort of structure of comics and their production. So thank you so much and stay tuned. Um, day one is going, we only had a couple of technical glitches uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments. And we will see you back here around two. Bye-bye.